You see, Peter had a very different understanding of what it means to be the Messiah than Jesus did. If you were a Jewish person in the first century, living under the thumb of oppression from the Roman Empire, you would be eager for the Messiah. And you would celebrate your eagerness regularly by remembering the last time or previous times that God had raised up a Savior to deliver you from the oppression of the pagans. One of those times happened 164 years before Jesus was born. A fellow named Judas Maccabeus. And Judas Maccabeus found himself and his kinsmen under the thumb of a foreign oppressor. A fellow named Antiochus Epiphanes. Remember that, it will be on the test. Antiochus Epiphanes IV, to be precise. And Antiochus had come in and he had disrupted the temple and he had taken over Judea. And this guy was cruel on top of cruel. Like, bring some pigs in and sacrifice them on the altar. And you know how offensive that would be to the good Jewish boys and girls. And so here they are, slaves in their own land, with pagans ruling. And Judas, what does he do? Well, he gets a posse together. And they sharpen their swords, and they sharpen their spears, and they go in for the great battle. And amazingly, they win. And the pagans are defeated, and the temple is cleansed, and the sacrifices resume their proper administration. And they inaugurate a celebration that would be held every year. You know it. It's called Hanukkah. The annual celebration of Hanukkah is a celebration of the victory of Judas Maccabeus 164 years before Jesus was born. And when Peter thinks you're the Messiah, he thinks you're going to do the same thing Judas did. The people of God are under the thumb of Roman oppression and we need someone to set us free. So when Jesus says, the Son of Man... Messiah, remember, you can have the right words and have the wrong meaning. Jesus has got to take Peter's understanding of Messiah and flip it on its head. So he says, let me, let me help you out here. This is what it means. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering. Okay, that's, you know, the guys who fought against Antiochus probably experienced some suffering. Everybody probably didn't make it. Some of them, you know, gave their lives for the cause. They're suffering in these kind of conflicts. Okay. Be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes. Okay, not everybody might be on board with the agenda, but we get that. But then comes the next thing, and this is the thing where Peter just flips his lid and loses it. The Son of Man must be killed, and after three days, rise again. And again, we think, duh. Like, that's what Jesus does. But here's the thing. Remember, Put yourself in Peter's sandals. You're thinking about what it means to be the Messiah in terms of folks like Judas and others, because he wasn't the only one, who sought to free the people from oppression. You've just said Jesus is the Messiah. Now you've got expectations for him. And he's explained that he's going to be killed. Forget the rising from the dead thing. They didn't, have, they didn't expect Jesus to be raised from the dead because they didn't expect him to die. Because after all, if Judas had thought he was a Messiah and died trying to kick Antiochus out of Jerusalem, well, that would have simply demonstrated that he wasn't actually God's anointed one, wouldn't it? In the first century, a dead Messiah is a false Messiah. You can't beat the bad guys if you're six feet under. So when Jesus says, the Son of Man, me, the Messiah, is going to be killed... Like, he didn't even have to get to the confusing raised three days later thing. Peter was gone right there. He did not have a category for a dead Messiah. Well, he did. It was a false Messiah. Right? There's no, you're not the Messiah if you're dead in the first century in Jerusalem. You're only the Messiah if you beat the bad guys, then we'll put you on the throne. So how does Peter respond? I've got to straighten Jesus out. Not a good place to be, friends. 
Not a good place to be. The way Peter answered the one question determines everything for him. Defines every moment. And even though he answered that question with the right words, his heart was not in the right place. He, he didn't allow Jesus to define what it means to be the Messiah, the anointed one. He insisted on determining these things for himself and was unwilling to deny himself and offer himself to Jesus so that Jesus could determine what it means to be the Messiah. What does it mean for Jesus to be the Messiah? How do we answer that one question? It means that we sacrifice self-determinism and practice self-denial. That's what it means for Jesus for him to be the Messiah, doesn't it? He doesn't ask followers to take up a cross because he has no intention of doing that himself. He's the first one to do it. Jesus embodies self-denial. Jesus, whose face dripped with blood as he hung on the tree. Body was shredded. Hands pierced. Flesh torn. Jesus embodies what he asks for. 